So Kimberly, what was it like growing up in Oklahoma? It was the best because it wasn't just Oklahoma, it was southeastern Oklahoma, which, you know, our viewership will know. It's McCurtain County. It's as southeast as you can go. A place into its own. A, very much so. Um, and the county seat of the place much into its own. So it was this really wonderful kind of, I mean, as we're kind of known down there as like the outlaws and it's a little bit dangerous. And of course, you don't realize that growing up. You just know that wherever you turn, there's a story being told. There's some kind of drama or or comedy. There's either tragedy or comedy going on all the time. And then surrounded by some of the most beautiful nature, I think, in the country. So, you know, beautiful, we call them mountains. I suppose they're, they're large hills. But, you know, the mountains and, and Beaver's Bend and, um, you know, beautiful creeks running through and um, just tons of pasture land. And so you could, and it was very much that time when you could just hop on your bike and be gone, you know, in the summertime all day. And your mom's like, you know, be back for lunch or be back for dinner and, you know, no, pre, you know, no cell phones, no anything. And you were safe and you, you knew everybody and everybody knew you. So it was, it's, it was a lot of freedom. And, and, and a lot of beauty and, and a lot of great characters, especially in <laughs> Haida Bell, Oklahoma. Tell me about the native culture where you grew up. Well, we have a lot of full blood Choctaw um, where I grew up and the language was spoken. And so it was a really definitive part of growing up. And um, I, I just, you know, again, you don't realize it at the time, but I felt very fortunate because it felt like, now I don't know if this is true, but it felt like our, our community was very much African American, Native American, and Anglo American. So it was just really nice melting pot, and um, and and we all supported each other and, and got along. I would say, f you know, for the for the most part. I mean, we did have a race riot when I was there, when I was in ninth grade. But it really, it really wasn't about race. It was about. Um, I mean, I think the the folks that that perpetrated the crime um, against one of my friends, uh, an African American young man. Um, but they were from Arkansas. They had come in, and and, and and it was really interesting to watch the town rally. Mm -hmm and maybe even differences that they perceived that they had, they didn't have so much um, because the KKK came in to like try to like, you know, just create a, a firestorm. Walter Cronkite covered it and it was just a really big thing. And then that's when I really understood, no, we're, we're Ida Bell. Like we're, you know, we have our own issues, but when it comes down to it, we're really supportive of one another, whether you're black, white, native, didn't matter. Um, Vietnamese, we had uh, quite a few Vietnamese come, you know, and which was so thrilling as a second grader to have these beautiful, I mean, they were really, they were just beautiful girls come in and they were just like, oh my gosh, they're so cool. And they didn't speak English and we didn't speak Vietnamese, but trying to bridge that, you know, communication gap and make them feel comfortable and, and at home. So it was a really, you know, it was a beautiful melting pot to grow mm -hmm. up in. So it sounds like you grew up at least feeling very inclusive. Was yes. there ever a time that you felt different? I always felt different. Um, and here's why, because I was adopted as a native child. I was adopted into a white family. Um, when I was five and a half months old. And um, so there was always a sense of being very, very loved and very protected and very included, just as you would if you were a biological child. But, you know, I mean, you know my brother very well. And, you know, I mean, we don't, <laughs> clearly, don't look alike. We don't look alike. And I grew up in a time of like the Sesame Street era where there was this little like song that they would sing on Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not like the rest. And you would, it was triangles and circles, or it was a whole bunch of fours and one, you know, one. And you, as a child, you'd pick. And so I always kind of felt like, oh yeah, I'm the, I'm that one. I'm, I'm the different one. But it was never in a bad way. It was never in a way that made me feel less than or made me feel um, unloved or, or as an outsider. It was just other. And so what happened was um, my antenna was always up because I knew I was different. I knew something was going on and I had a, even a deeper sense. And I think it comes from my indigenous DNA of like, there's a reason for this. There's a reason that all this is happening. There's a story being told, a greater story being told and you're part of it. I always had that feeling. And what was really interesting is, is when I found, um, when I mom told me when I was, um, and it was brilliant the way she, she presented it to me. I was three and a half or four. And I know it was definitely before I started school. And she, you know, she explained to me that I was adopted and what that meant and, and, and how much they loved me. And she even had a book um, because uh, there was, my biological mom had put the information about my tribal heritage with my birth certificate. So I actually am descended from leaders on, on my, my maternal biological side. So um, my mom had found this book and my, in this book it says that my great grandmother, Christine George, was the granddaughter of Chief Seattle. And they actually called her an Indian princess. 
because it was written by um, the the brothers, the Jesuit the Jesuit priest, and and so that was their perception was that you know if you're a chief's daughter, you're an Indian princess. So you tell a four year old. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, this is, <laughs> I'm an Indian princess. I have a responsibility to the world, to my people, to all people. And at four years old, it was like, okay, I can do this. And I've always kind of had this, like, give me the, you know, give me the ball coach, like, mm -hmm. put me up, like, put me up to bat. And, um, and then at the same time, my father served on the Wheelock Academy um, on the orphanage board. Mm -hmm. There was a, 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 and it was primarily Choctaw, Choctaw kids that were there. And so we would go out, and my dad had a department store growing up, a little you know country store in Idabel, and um, and so we would take out jeans and coats and things like that in the winter. And and so I went within this one day. It was still before, probably around that time, and it shook me to my core when I'm sitting in a nice warm station wagon with my dad on a Sunday afternoon right after Thanksgiving and we're dropping off all these these nice clothes um, you know to, to the and I'm like where are we going I'm sure I'll go anywhere I'm an adventurer like let's go where are we going and I saw all these kids that look just like me that look just like me and they're they're just sitting out on the the front porches of you know essentially these like group homes on the Wheelock Academy, which was this Choctaw orphanage, a native orphanage, and it, and that's really when it hit, hit. It was like there's, I'm no different. That like the, that is me, and somehow I ended up here. So I have a responsibility to them, to myself, to wherever I came from, to the world, to just again keep my antenna up. Like why am I here? What what am I supposed to do in this world? And then as I got older, and I and I researched, um, you know, I studied Native American history at UCLA, and. In, in, and also just talking to our native people around the country was that there was this kind of predominant idea that our ancestors prayed up to seven generations ahead. So I got it in my head at a very young age that Chief Seattle like had like prayed, like I don't understand what's going on, like I'm gonna send an ambassador out on my behalf to go like figure out the lay of the land and kind of build a bridge between this new world that's coming in and our world as we've known it for millennia. And um, so, right or wrong, that was, you know, preschool age for me, that's kind of what I hooked on to. And my brother and I took a trip to Seattle with my grandparents, who were from Midwest City, um, when I was probably six. And so it all, and I got to see Chief Seattle's statue, and I was just like, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and what's crazy is, as kind of delusional as that is, it's, it ended up being, you know, just kind of this like, this drumbeat to my life of like, how do I serve? How do I serve humanity? How do I serve our indigenous people? How do I serve the, the people around me that I love, you know, um, that I care about, this world that I care about? And, and so, and it's, you know, now at middle age, it's like it's proven to kind of be true, you know, and, and it's, it's all happened because of Oklahoma. Did any of this, did that push you into the theater? Yes, um, yes, I think, the, <laughs> or pull you into the theater. It pulled me into the theater. My mom was a, started our community theater in McCurtain County along with several people there in, in Idabel. And she was a fantastic director. She came here to, to Oklahoma State and was, I mean, won like a national speech competitions up against, you know, students from Northwestern and Harvard. And yeah, I mean, she was phenomenal. And um, she was a great director. And so my brother, Chris, and my dad, Bob, and, you know, several of our friends and community members would, would work in her productions. But my, um, I was smitten with television. And you know, I grew up with, we actually got Dallas and Shreveport stations. So it was just like this, you know, you come home and it was like an hour of Bewitched followed by an hour of Gilligan's Island followed by an hour of The Lucy Show. And so, I mean, I grew up, I think, with some great comedy, not to mention it was 70s, you know, prime time, which was Norman Lear and, you know, all in the family and good times and all this really fantastic, um, comedy and, and, and issue-driven comedy. And so I think that's just kind of rooted in my artistic DNA. And um, so I, I think subconsciously I thought, well, if, if, if I want to do good in the world, what's a, what's a good way to do that? And um, I thought, why, why not be on television? I don't know how that, I mean, it was just like, I remember it clicking. I remember it clicking and, and I was, I remember exactly the day that I decided I wanted to go to UCLA and I was watching, you know, being a good, Oklahoma girl, I was obsessed with college football with everybody else. And we were that Thanksgiving weekend, we were over at my Uncle David's in Broken Bow, and we were watching the USC UCLA game happened to be on that weekend. And I saw this beautiful pom pom girl with like, you guys may remember this from, like, from back, beautiful blonde Barbie doll of a human being with UCLA in her chest and the blue and gold pom pom. And I just went, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. 
But you did. And I did. I mean, again, it was like this delusional thing. <laughs> I'm like, that's what I want to be. And so somehow that, and then I started kind of looking at like, where do they make these shows? Will they make them in Hollywood? Well, look at like, it, remember the atlases? I mean, this is pre-Google map, you know? And it's just like, oh, look, Hollywood's right by this school called UCLA. And it's like, yes. So I'm like, I'm going to go to UCLA. I'm going to be a pom-pom girl. And, um, and then I'm going to do television and movies. And then I don't know what. And so I just, that was the story I told myself mm -hmm. over and over and over again growing up in Idabel. And, you know, that's kind of come to fruition. Yeah. <laughs> when you went there, did you see yourself as a Native American actress or an actress or a Native American? I did not, I did not understand it. Um, it wasn't a conscious thing. And I think, um, I think especially for, for, for people that were kind of coming of age in the 80s. I mean, very much like a John Huston baby. Like, well, that's just not where our head went. It's a very consumer-oriented time, right? It's a very me, it's a very me generation back in the 80s. And so that really wasn't a, um, it was a more of a fit in. Like, everybody wear these kind of Levi's and this kind of polo shirt and this. And I would never was that person anyway. I always kind of marched to the beat of my own drummer. But when I came to UCLA, and I talked like this, I talked like I was from McCartan County, mm -hmm. And so everybody, you know, UCLA is a 30,000 person campus. And one of my favorite things about um, coming, this, this thing that I had envisioned was nobody will know who I am. I can go there and be anonymous. You know, whereas in Ida Bell or Broken Bow or, you know, I mean, we all knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody. And I thought, what a cool thing to be anonymous for the first time in my life, you know. And, but I show up on campus talking like this, but looking like this. And so I, people thought, you know, I was Mexican American, I was Polynesian, I was what? But they did not expect this to come out of my mouth. Hi, I'm Kim, how are you? Like, what's going on? And I'm very friendly Oklahoman and just introducing myself to everybody. And so immediately I became like that girl, like get that girl to say something, you know? <laughs> and then inevitably, you know, I'd be like, hi, I'm Kim. And they're like, oh my God, like what's, what is this all about? And they said, they would say, what are you? And I had never been asked that in Oklahoma. I don't, we just didn't really ask that of one another back, at least back in the 80s. And I was like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, what, what, all, what is all this? And I said, I'm Native American. They're like, what? And then I would explain, you know, I'm Cherokee. I'm, you know, Colville and Salish Kootenai. And, you know, just so many of the students there had never, you know, run across a Native person. And so it kind of, you know, there was, it was a, it was a really cool double sword. It, in both ways, it cut really nicely because it was like, oh, well, this is this is something that makes me special. Um, not that I wanted to stand out, but it's like that's just a reality. But also, it was like, oh, well, this is an underrepresented group currently at UCLA, you know. And UCLA to me was always about that. UCLA is about optimism. UCLA is about inclusiveness. UCLA is about, you know, the greater worldview. Um, and so to, to be representative of that was kind of exciting. Again, I'm like that, I'm like that person, like take, I'll take the burden, like put it on me. So um, that's kind of when I think it kind of locked in. It's like, oh yeah, I'm a native. My identity is, is for me and it's I'm perfectly okay with that, it being a, a cultural, you know, I'm, I am from Oklahoma, I am a native, you know, woman. And, and what does that mean? And, and how can I contribute to the conversation? So that's, that's kind of when it kicked in. Take me into your professional acting career. Mm -hmm. So, um, ironically, when I was, I did audition, try out for, um, a, they, they call them song girls out there at UCLA, and there were seven of us back in the day. Now they call it a dance team, but back then it was song girl, pom pom girl. Um, but we were still pretty, like the hot thing, you know, it was a very big thing. I think there were like 700 girls that tried out. And, um, and I, I don't know how I did it, but I nabbed one of the seven spots. And that year we had a really good basketball team. Reggie Miller was on our team and, and we did really well. So we had a lot, of, a lot of people came to the games. And so a casting director came to the game and saw us and had myself and another girl come audition for an AT&T commercial. And I ended up getting that commercial. And I promise you, I think it was more just how goofy and off the turnip truck I had just fallen. The guys, just, they said, bring a headshot. I had no idea what a headshot was. So I brought my senior picture from Ida Bell. <laughs> and I had, I mean, you know, like the, the one that's like the Olin Mills, like the really nice, you know, thick one. And I, I, why I had a senior picture of myself, I have no idea. And I don't even think it was an eight by 10. I think it was like probably a five by seven, but I laid it down. And I'm like, will this work? Because I don't really know. My head's on there, and it's a shot. So, <laughs> and so they, um, so I did my little audition, and I said, and I left the casting office, and I came back, and I said, 
can I get that back? And they just fell out laughing. So they made a photocopy of it, wrote my information down, and gave me the, and I got that part. <laughs> and that role got me, it was a national commercial, it got me into Screen Actors Guild. Okay. And so, um, and it also really, it, I made a lot of money on that commercial. I had no idea. You made residuals, you know, so these checks kept coming in. And I, all of a sudden, my parents, I think, were not so afraid of me going into the acting. It's like, that's just that's a significant amount of money for one night of work, you know? And, um, and I was just a cheerleader on this commercial. It was really fun. So then after I graduated from college, I said, I'm not going to quit college. That was the thing. Are you going to quit college and pursue this full time? And I'm like, I can't. I can't because if I do and I get a job, I'll never go back. I know myself. I'm not that disciplined. And it was very important to me that I had my, ed my education, my, my degree. Um, and so I finished up. I was a history major, as I said. And I thought you know, my fallback plan will be um, if I, I'm going to give myself two years and if nothing happens, then I would love to teach Native American history because I personally didn't have any Native professors in history at UCLA, which was a fantastic program. But there were no Natives teaching Native history. I was like, how cool would that be? You know, because if there's a, sometimes if there's a question that a student would have, like I can sometimes go to a tribal member, say in Montana, a Cheyenne member, and, and as me, because they know me and I've worked with, they, they might tell me things they wouldn't tell. They might trust me with information they wouldn't tell other people. You know, and, I, and then I also have the respect to say, can I share this with my students or can I share this with the public at large or is this something that we shouldn't talk about? Or, you know, you, you know it should be stay within the tribe. And so just having that respect, you know, that was my fallback, fallback plan. So I just graduated and um, I was a member of a group that Will Sampson started. God rest his soul. Love, I mean, my gosh, what an instrumental figure, you know, for Native people in Hollywood. And it was called, um, I believe it was called the American Indian Directory. And it was, in, it was to help Hollywood producers and directors realize that there are trained Native actors out there in Hollywood versus just hiring somebody. And, you know, putting a whole bunch of dark makeup on them and a wig and sending them out to be native. And so I had joined that when I was still at UCLA and a big role had just come out uh, for a miniseries called Son of the Morning Star that ABC was doing. And it was the story, it was based on a novel, historical novel, um, uh, non, no, no, it was, no, it was nonfiction, um, about Custer. And it was as told from his, the perspective of his wife and his Cheyenne wife which a lot of people didn't know he was married to a Cheyenne girl as well and had children. So I play, um, I played her cousin who's kind of telling who, you know, whoever wrote the book, like had this extensive knowledge of and had, you know, firsthand account from this woman that, that I ended up playing. Um, so I, I auditioned for that role and that was my first kind of on camera role. I had no clue what I was doing and just showed up fresh in Montana and you know, just, I had friends that were in the business and I just said, what, just help me understand when I walk in there, you know, what's going to be happening. I know it's, I've just seen, you know, a little bit of that behind the scenes, but I know enough to know I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I don't want to make a complete fool of myself. And so, you know, I just learned as much as I could. Well, this is what your mark is and this is what your, the sound guy does. And this is, you know, what's all around us and how to work with it. And you still don't know until you, you go in there. But I also wasn't afraid to say, hey, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what that means. Like, you know, if they said, go to the, you know, go talk to the PA about that. There's this whole other shorthand, you know, of making films. I'm like, I don't know what that means. And just having a good sense of humor about it, and um, but it was it was fantastic, and I ended up you know becoming friends with many of many members of that cast, mm -hmm. and Gary Cole was ended up being a really dear friend who I ended up working with on August Osage County, and um, and are, we're still very close. So it was, it was interesting how like, once you're kind of into the community, you maintain those relationships, and um, and they they deepen and you know, kind of grow over time. So, and then it just kind of rolled from there. I went to work on As It Will Turns for two years in New York City. And, um, and that was really wonderful, but I found out that I was not a soap opera person. <laughs> and it wasn't, it was just, um, there just wasn't a lot of, you know, I don't, I like challenges. I like adventure and I like, you know, that's one of the reasons I went into television instead of theater was, you know, I just kind of want to be doing something different, like, I want a new character, I want a new, I mean, in my dreamy dream world, mm -hmm. you know, the how fun to get to be a different character. Or even if you're a regular on a series, every week it's a different story and you're dealing with different issues. And, you know, so that was still really appealing to me. I was a brand, you know, just a brand new baby actor. So I just, I actually um, did not re-sign my contract and came back to Los Angeles. And 
you know, by the grace of God, right after that, um, I got Northern Exposure, and um, I played Ed's girlfriend on Northern Exposure, and I got the Seinfeld, the epic Seinfeld job, and um, did this incredible uh, uh, TV movie called Geronimo um, that Ted Turner was, just got behind this incredible series of Native American stories, his, historical stories, and so God, it was just a lot of work. And it was, you know, right after Dance, we, we were shooting Sun of the Morning Star at the same time they were shooting Dances with Wolves. So a bunch of our guys, Rodney Grant being one of them, just came over from dances onto our set. And so it was just a very, it was a kind of a hot time. You know, I got really, really fortunate. I was very blessed to like be there at the right time, kind of when we had a little flourish of Native storylines and things like that. And we're kind of back to it. We're kind of coming back. I think this year, I think we're going to see a lot more Natives on television and in film, which I'm thrilled about, mm -hmm. you know. Let me ask you, how seminal was the Seinfeld role? Because that was one of the, I mean, with humor, they said some very serious things. Very serious. No, I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things, they say, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You know, and I took acting very, I still do my craft very seriously, and I'm still pr a practicing actor. I'm still learning and growing. But it was one of those things, I'll never forget walking in that day. And you just know, you kind of know. Like I said, my antenna was up from the time I was a little girl. And you know you're walking into some, and Seinfeld wasn't even Seinfeld. You know, I mean, we were talking 93, the end of 93. It hadn't even kind of hit its, it hadn't even begun to hit its peak, mm -hmm. you know, when we did it. It was just kind of hitting then. And no, nobody knowing that it would just be this thing that continued to exponentially grow and have, you know, influence around the world. And, but I knew, I just had this gut instinct, like this is a very cool thing. And comedy is my wheelhouse. That's what I love. Anybody that's been to McCurtain County, and I think in Oklahoma in general, I think humor is, is an aspect that define us as Oklahomans and for, for sure Native American Oklahomans. I mean, you can't be with a Native person in Oklahoma and not be laughing hysterically within five minutes, you know? And so it was like, boom, I get to do this. This is going to be great. And I, I'll never forget, I walked in. I think the casting director had worked with me on something else, but they, they didn't make me do the, the, the kind of the cattle call casting. He brought me in for himself, like kind of on a callback. And then the producer's call was later that afternoon. It was interesting because I had another callback for Walker, Texas Ranger that same day. So I went from one audition to the other audition. And I walked in, and I remember thinking, if I get the, well, I mean, if I get the Seinfeld, I'm not doing the Walker. Like, I want to do comedy. And, um, and I walked in with the girl. and. Two of the girls I recognized off the bat. They were two girls that you anybody would have recognized. They were beautiful, kind of guest starring character actors, but um, and they may have been they may have been native. You know, I didn't ask them. I just I had not seen them in, on any other kind of native calls or anything like that. And then one girl was just bless her heart. There were just there were some actors that would show up on these native calls that would just come in buckskin and feathers and basically war paint. You're like, oh sister, like. Don't do that to yourself. Like, give yourself a chance, you know? I mean, I'm walking around as a Native woman in L.A. in 1993, and I'm not, you know, this, I don't have to. But the other two girls, I was, I, at first, at first second, for a second I was worried because they were pretty famous. I mean, like, I had seen them, and they, they got a lot of roles, and I'm just like, no, no, this is my role. I'm Winona, you know? And it just, and I just knew it. I'm like, no, this is what I was born, I was born to do this. <laughs> I was born to be be funny and be you know to own this, and it's it. Um, so I just I walked in and the the callback was for for the producers. So it's Larry David, Jerry Seinfeld, the casting director, and then just a slew of producers in this a room half this size, very very small small room, and they're literally like all seated and then some standing. And, it's, and then you're just up, you're, and everybody's seated, and you're up doing this thing. And again, it was one of those moments where instead of crumbling, it's just like, <laughs> yes, let's do this. And the, the writers were there, and they were so good. It was uh, Tom Gamble and Max Prost, and they ended up running Fox, um, Fox Nighttime. They're hilarious guys. And they'd written such a good, smart, funny thing. And I was just like ready to sink my teeth into it as an actor. And, you know, of course, Winona, is, as many Jerry's, of Jerry's girlfriends, are, they're the straight man. You play the straight man and let him be, you know. And so <laughs> it was just, which is not, clearly not my personality, but it was just, you know, it's just like, okay, you know. And it was just, and, and not, and just pushing, pushing, pushing. And I was reading with the casting director, but Jerry was right there, mm -hmm. and Larry David, and I was just like, you know.
giving them the, and they, the, the casting room, it was just, they were on the floor laughing. And I think they were, I, mean, I know Max and Tom were a little, the writers were a little bit scared because they were really pushing the boundaries. It's like, who are we, you know, to write this role for a Native woman? Like, how do we know that you feel this way or whatever? And so to see a Native woman own it and then push back, like take it, I'm like, no, bring, like, bring it on. Like, this is how, this is, comedy is the great leveler, you know? It's the great, like, let's just laugh and then we can talk. And neuroscience has proven that, you know, the endorphins come down instead of the cortisol and the, you know, it's just like, okay, endorphins down, we feel well, and now we can reason together. You know, because when we're like this, we can't think clearly. So it's laughter just kind of brings it down and lets us talk about things as human beings, you know, and not as my side, your side. So. Well, certainly some classic television, but, but could not be more opposite than your role in August Osage County. That's exactly right. And it's, it's funny, too, because Tracy Letts, um, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, who was from Durant, as we say in Idabel, um, son of the infamous Billy and Dennis Letts. Um, he, Tracy was also a Seinfeld, and I feel like he was on the Pirate Shirt episode, but I don't know, we'll have to look that up. So we both like kind of shared that Seinfeld, you know, we had our Seinfeld moment. But Tracy is, you know, Tracy's a fantastic comedian, and but Tracy, a lot of people didn't know this, but his dad, Dennis, was an enrolled member of the Muskogee Creek tribe. And so technically, Tracy could enroll um, if he had. I've been kind of on him to like, just enroll, Tracy, you know, just. And uh, it, because I think a lot of Tracy's storytelling comes from his indigenous roots, you know, and it's just, just I think the Oklahoma in general, like we make great storytellers because we're, we've got all these different viewpoints literally like living inside of our, our gene pool, you know. Um, but Jonna, he very specifically, uh, it was his, it was his allegory for America. Like, okay, America, like this is how I see, I see things. And he was telling it through the history of his own family and the dysfunction of his own family, as a microcosm for our state and our state as a microcosm for our country. And um, and so it was a very specific, which is why it won the Pulitzer Prize. It was a very specific. Um, intellectual response to what he was seeing, you know, what America was becoming. And so it was, it was vital for him, and it was vital for him that at the heart of it be this Native American character who is always there but rarely says anything. And, and even Tracy was, you know, kind of checking in, like, is this, how do you feel about this? And, you know, and I'm like, this is, this is it. Like, this is it. And I said, it's very interesting. I had an adopted Oto grandfather um, named Elwood Koshaway. And Elwood and Sophie, I met them on the, I was powwowing when I, I was a fancy shawl dancer um, back when I had just graduated from college. And, and I, I met and was adopted by these two amazing people and, and was very close with them. And, and, and just hearing, El, Elwood was an orphan back in the, the 20s. And, um, and, and so he, he even was, we were very kind of similar in a, in a way of like having these, our, both of our antenna up. He's like, I heard, I was floating a lot and I heard these things. And so he was telling me that his elders told him. Now keep in mind, this is people that remember the Trail of Tears or wherever, you know, they're, they're coming back um, to Oklahoma from these different, these different places and under duress. And his elder told him, um, Elwood, you keep your, you keep your head down. You don't look the white man in the eye. And just remember this, you know, because two things are going to happen. They're going to get angry at you and they're going to beat you up or they're going to feel guilty and that's bad for them. So either way, so just don't look at, now keep in mind, like I'm saying, he's growing up in the, the 20s and the early 30s and through the depression and the Dust Bowl. And so it's like, you know, I, cause I asked him, I said, why did the, cause I noticed, I'm like, why do the elders at powwows, like if a, a non-Indian person comes in, they just kind of put their heads down and they don't, you know, they don't interact. And, that, and that's when, when he told me this story. He said his, his elder told him, and it was a really beautiful way that he said it, it wasn't uh, unforgiving, it wasn't bitter, it was just like this is the way things are. And he said, we were here when they came, we're still here now, and we'll be here when they go. <laughs> <laughs> and or and I don't think I don't think from what um, Grandpa Koshway was saying it wasn't like they go it was more like their time ends, mm -hmm. you know that the the ascendancy mm -hmm. you know after it kind of starts to wane a bit and this next because that's what happens right we always cycle through and the world's I mean we have to evolve and change or we die right um, but but when after the ascendancy happens and we and we become this new thing which I hope America's doing I mean right we were just talking about that like. We're gonna go one way or the other, but if we could come into this new America, 
right? Where, that is more inclusive and that is more, um, um, less vitriolic and more like better together, more, uh, more a tribe, you know, like how we are at the Olympics where it's just like, okay, we can all get behind the team or whatever. Um, but I think that, 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 that Jonna was there to say, we're here. You know, we're here that when the dysfunction happens and, the, and things start to fall apart and your relationships start to break apart, um, the native people, the indigenous people, we know pain. We know how to get through heartache. We know how to get through uh, life's greatest transformations and brokenness and still come through with a smile on our face and love in our heart, you know, and laughter on our lips. Like, we know how to do this. We can help with this. And that's the last scene in August Osage County is, and Tracy meant it very specifically for the play to start with my character and me to be there silently through the whole thing, you know, being stuck away in the most in a inhospitable part of the house, a reservation, if you will, the hottest, furthest part from the rest of the country, you know, but coming down and helping and then going back up and coming down and helping and then going back up. And it's also, I think, represents a spirituality, you know, of just kind of being above it all in some ways, not in a superior way, just being able to have a, a greater worldview and saying, no, I can do this. And it's interesting at the end of the show, it's really profound. Um, Violet, the matriarch, comes up and she, she lays down in my arms and I sing, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends. And it's, it's in reference to a T.S. Eliot poem, which is referenced in the beginning, um, The Holloman, and that Tracy never finishes the poem and the, 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 the last line of that poem is not with a bang but a whimper. And so his message to the, to the country as a playwright, as an artist, was here's our future. You know, do we want to go out? You know, how do we want to go out? And, and having that, that kind of the fact that, that she's in Jonna's arms, this lovely Cheyenne woman who hasn't judged and just been there the whole time and just salt of the earth and just working, just trying to do her best, you know, but clearly has had her own bit of pain in her life. Um, you know, that it's saying, okay, is this, where are we now? Where are we now as, as a nation? And how, what are we gonna do? You know, and, and I think in, in some ways he was saying, we have an indigenous population who has, you know, wisdom from millennia, you know, on this continent that we, we have them. And, and I know because I'm with, I'm with indigenous leaders every day almost or in con you know, contact with them via social media or, or emails or, um, and it's an extraordinarily wise and insightful and uh, just ingenious group of people that can problem solve in ways that you know, are beyond me too. You know? And they're drawing on you know, what they've been taught from their grandparents, their grandparents' grandparents. And so I just think, I don't know, I think it's an exciting time to you know, to be indigenous and to, um, I think people now are like, okay, we give, like, what can we do to make things better? How can we make things better? You know, this, the whole, I think, farm to table movement is part of that. Like, how do we not depend on Chilean, you know, what do we, I mean, like our fruit, like we get fruit all the time now and we didn't when we were kids, you know, it's like it was seasonal and it was nearby because you couldn't have things trucked in from wherever, it's just too, you know, exorbitant in cost. So it's, it's just basic. And I think it's also a very Oklahoman um, uh, value is common sense, practical common sense. What's, what's the best way to move forward? What's the most efficient way to move forward? You know, how do we get the biggest bang for our buck? You know, what, what, what about growing it right here? We've got lots of good land in Oklahoma, you know. Now, some of your film work has brought you back to the state. Yes. And it has been a, th I mean, I could not have been happier to get the call to audition for Wilma Mankiller. I was also talking about like now stepping up to the plate. That was still, that even for me was a little bit, you know, overwhelming to think about trying to fill, you know, those shoes of mm -hmm. such an iconic woman and leader and um, thinker and just an incredible human being. But getting to come back to Oklahoma really, it, it gave me a lot of peace. Like, no, I'm, I'm home and this is, this is one of our stories. And so, um, the the being able to to take the two things that I love, which is home, Oklahoma, and filming. I'm like I'm happiest on a film set. I'm either either with kids, a group of kids. When I say kids, I mean like it could be 18 to 20, you know, 
14 to 22, whatever, but, or on a film set. Those are my two like happy places. So to have, to be on a film set in Oklahoma, you know, it's just, it was a, the joy of my life. And to get to be telling Wilma's story um, and, and the kind of, um, Wilma did not want a movie made about her, which is really, really? which is why it's not called like the Wilma Man Killer story. Mm -hmm. thing. She's like, no, this is about the people, this is about the community. And, um, and I think they did a really good job at, at really shining the light, you know, on how Wilma empowered the community to do what they always had with them, with, mm. within them in the first place. And it was actually how I was able to connect with how am I going to be, I, Kimberly, how am I going to be able to, to, to personify this, this woman that's bigger than life? And, and Wilma herself said, she said, at, at the heart, at my heart, I'm a cheerleader. And when I heard her say that, I'm like, okay, we're good. We're good, because at my heart, I'm a cheerleader. And so that's where I built, started building the character from. Mm -hmm. um, and, just, and just always remembering you know, that, that shared common thing that we had about you know, just cheering other people on and helping them be their best. And so getting to come back, um, and I have family in Tahlequah, and so you know, going to the set during the day and working and then getting to see you know, my sisters and my aunties and uncles mm -hmm. or my cousins at night, you know, or nieces and nephews. It was just such a gift. And that, that was a first in my life to be able to do that. Um, and I, also just to be back in Oklahoma for such a, a long period of time and, and just to remember why I love this place so much. And in doing that, um, I met a character, fantastic woman named Cindy Soap, who is, she has a starring role um, in the, the film. And her dad was actually on the original water line, helping build the water line uh, with Wilma. And, and, so, and Steve Rivas plays her father's role. But Cindy and I got to be really good friends. And then I pitched an idea, I kind of formulated an idea for a reality show called Mama Cherokee. Mm. And, um, had a, had a producing partner who's Lakota and lives in New York and works with National Geographic and different places. So we pitched to Loud Entertainment who does, they do like, they're a London based uh, crew but they're also based in New York and they have like Real Housewives of New York and they do Real, uh, House Hunters International and, <laughs> and so they love the idea. So we went into a co-production deal with them and um, so we, they had a, a British film crew come in to shoot the sizzle reel mm -hmm. for Mama Cherokee so you've got all these Brits coming into Stillwell, Oklahoma, and like the you know the surround, and it was just I mean it's like it's so good. So it's full blood Cherokee and just Cherokee people with these like this British film crew, and then so this um, this year when I was writing my my latest pilot, um, mm -hmm. I was like what you know I was just thinking of all the stories. I'm like I would love to tell that story. I mean like I loved that culture clash, but it wasn't a clash at all. Mm -hmm. It was like. You know, <laughs> it was like Reese's peanut butter cups. It's like, oh yeah, let's put chocolate and peanut butter together. It's like, let's put Brits and Cherokees together. You know, it was just, oh my gosh, it was fantastic. And so I wrote a show called Big Heart that mm -hmm. I would love to shop. I'm hoping to shop it, you know, the summer into the fall. Mm -hmm. But that's my dream is to get one of, you know, and it doesn't have to be mine. I just really love this show. It's really funny. I think mm -hmm. it's very fresh. It's very Northern exposure, mm -hmm. but you know, set, you know, in, in Oklahoma and, um, um, to kind of to your point, it's like yeah, there is there absolutely. I have thematic issues at the heart, but you're you're going to be hard pressed to kind of find them. I mean, it's they'll mm -hmm. they'll come out. I think I think through osmosis, but it's really about being a human being and and laughing and getting through things together. And um, so I'm I'm that's my you know my all time best possible world is is being able to produce a show, mm -hmm. you know, that I've written back here in Oklahoma and mm -hmm. show the world this incredible world that I'm privy to. And, and you are, but I do have to ask, did you ever in your career, maybe in your youth, want to be Anglo? Um, n I mean, not, I think, you know, when, when you're middle school, you know, I, I definitely remember um, there was a, there, <laughs> there was there, I think it was in fifth grade, where I was French for about eight months. I have no idea why I chose French. I mean, who doesn't want to be French? Yeah. Um, and I remember there was, anybody my age will remember these things. They were like like, like a buff puff. And like all of a sudden it was like, just you know, take the top surface of your skin off and I <laughs> going home. And just like rubbing. And I just, just trying to like lighten, you know, just not be so native, you know, whatever. But it was a kind of a short lived, yeah. It was a short-lived little thing, and it was really interesting um, because we had Indian education, mm -hmm. you know, in our schools, and so in fifth, I think it was fifth hour, we had to, we had to go to Indian. If you were native, you went to Indian education, 
And I, I, you know, you just back then, you just want to fit in. You just don't want to be different. Right. And so to be pulled out away, you know, and my friends were, I mean, my Choctaw friends had to go with me too, you know, but the, the big group of us, I didn't want to be pulled away from anybody in my class, you know, mm -hmm. for, so for us to be singled out and put into Indian education. But ironically enough in that class, um, you know, I think that, that there were things I learned in that class too. It's just like, no, 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 like, you know, you just to, to be, I won't say be proud, but you are who you are, and this is a good thing, you know, mm -hmm. and um, so, and definitely not, I mean, like, when I came to, to when I, I was just grateful, honestly, Hollywood, if you're, if you're particularly good looking, if you're particularly buff, if you're particularly uh, funny, you know, what you, the Hollywood will put, find a niche for you, mm -hmm. you know, you're not, I mean, there's, it's the rare person that gets to be Meryl Streep or Daniel Day-Lewis, who really gets to carve out their own path and play whatever they want to play. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly Halle Berry has done that in her career. But um, to, to have a foothold in Hollywood was, was you know, a gift. And of course I would want um, an opportunity to play any role, you know, to play a doctor. And if I, was, if I was not, if I didn't look like I would, I think I'm a relatively talented person. I'm really easy to get along with. So I think I would have gotten more work. Mm -hmm. did, did I not? I mean, I told mm -hmm. you I was one of the models for Disney's Pocahontas. So mm -hmm. I mean, if I wasn't the, the t you know, the classic native maiden, you know, I, I probably would have gotten a lot more work. But I just, it's okay. I mean, I really, it's beyond okay. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to have, you know, carved this path. And maybe every time I was on a set, you know, I had, when I was on The Sopranos, um, you know, the, the, the guys were like going off on Native American. It was like the Seinfeld episode on The Sopranos set, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, Steve Buscemi and uh, Michael Imperioli were just like, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. <laughs> They're like, I think she's Native American. It was great. And then when they found out, the guy that plays Polly Walnuts, I can't remember his name, mm -hmm. he found out, he's like, what you, oh my God, why didn't you tell me? And then I had to come have lunch with them, and it was just, and it's this really wonderful cultural exchange. So wherever, and Larry David and I like had a really great right. time on the set of Seinfeld talking about indigenous. And he's like, I don't understand. Like, why do you have to play? Like, why can't you just play whatever you want? Like, mm -hmm. I don't look at you like just as a native woman. Mm -hmm. or, and it's just the way that our industry is. It's just you find a pigeonhole and, you know, so I, you know, I, I've never, yes, I get that my career would have been broader probably, mm -hmm. or I wouldn't have worked. I'm telling you, you go into any casting office in Hollywood mm -hmm. and you will find beautiful, talented, I mean, I don't say beautiful because TV is kind of, it's a mm -hmm. visual medium and, and they like a certain kind of look. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a character actor, you have to be, you that know, look. you got to have that look. And it's got to be turned up to 11, as they would say in Spinal Tap. So <laughs> it's like, you know, to, to, to get to work. I mean, there's beautiful, talented people that have never seen the light of day. Mm -hmm. And you're just going, ur, ur, America should be seeing you. Mm -hmm. You're so good. Mm -hmm. You're so good. But there's, you know, 6,000 of you out there, and there weren't 6,000 of me. Mm -hmm. There was my girlfriend, Irene Bedard, who did the voice of Pocahontas, my girlfriend, Kateri Walker, <laughs> my girlfriend, Georgina Lightning. I mean, I know my Native sisters. And is, I there a, them. is there a Native yes. community in Delana Hollywood? Delana Studi, West Studi's niece. Okay. Fantastic. She, I was rallying for her to play my role when we went to London mm -hmm. on August Osage County. Please hire Delana Studi. She'll get this role. You know, to the, And she did end up finally, they, they, um, she, she won the role on the Broadway tour. Okay. So traveled with August you know, all over. So there's a community of Native actors that have loved and supported each other from, you know, from the get-go, so it's you know, we you know we're, we're supportive of you know, and it's a very tight-knit community. Mm -hmm. So, Kimberly, some of these very popular roles, how did that change your social outlook? Well, I think you know, from my college education, it, it, that alone uh, gave me the the lens to look at the world through a historical perspective, and specifically the way we looked at it at UCLA was. Um, a very holistic lens. So you look at the economics, the the political science behind an issue, the um, anthropology behind. It. Are they matrilineal, patrilineal societies? You know, all those different things really weigh into our decisions. And so when I was developing characters, um, I would uh, I would have to go into you know character development of like who is this person and and make the best choices based on the words on the page and the parameters of the story. And so every time you do that, every time you investigate somebody, um, it's very much like a journalist. You know, you're, you're, ans you're, you're trying to find the mystery. You're trying to find the, the, the narrative thread and, and build the most believable, you know, well-rounded character that you can. Um, and so 
I think with each character that, that I took in, they each have their set of wounds, they each have their victories and their, their defeats. And so that necessarily, it just, it just by necessity, it, it, it enlarges your heart. You know, it enlarges your mind, and, and you, so you take on a little bit of this every time. You know, even play, playing Winona in Seinfeld, um, you know, she's a brilliant woman. I mean, here she is, this native woman in New York City who's working at a pretty, you know, high, she, whatever she was doing, you know, she was, she was there and she was doing it. So it was like even getting in that frame of mind, like who, what, what, what kind of chutzpah must that take, you know, for a woman to do this? And so with each, um, with each character, you know, I'm learning about different tribes and about their issues. And then what happened was um, consequently when I was on As the World Turns, which happened to be a very popular soap opera amongst Indian grandmas, if there are any Native people out there, you know this. Your, your grandmas, great-grandmas love that show. So I started getting called out to reservations across the country. And they would want me to talk to their youth and say, basically just get up in front of them and say, tell them how you did this. Like, how did you get from, you know, a small town in Oklahoma to New York City mm -hmm. on a soap opera? And basically be a role model. Like, just tell them how you did this. How, how did you go to UCLA? And so that's really... Um, how it was kind of part and parcel to who I became as uh, as an adult was this this dual dual responsibility and career of being out in the reservation and in native communities in general working with our youth and then taking all that back to Hollywood or to New York um, and then and, and making sure that this each character that I play had this depth because I, I was was playing mainly Native American characters and so I took it very seriously if I was playing Apache then I found out like who was in a, you know, because not all Apache's Apache. I mean, it's Chiricahua and um, Hickoria and White Mountain and what did they believe and, you know, at this particular time and, and it was very, you know, easy to find a friend of a friend and I could call him up and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this and, and how should I approach this? I mean, I learned things like you don't put your hair behind your ear, like this particular role, like that's very, that's not a demure thing to do and this girl was Cochise's niece and she would have been very demure. And so it's just little things like that. and and. Um, it's in doing that, then I started seeing some of the issues, you know, that were happening on our reservations and in Native American communities. And I think that just you, you can't help when you see people um, suffering and suffering with such great dignity and humanity and maintaining their sense of humor and their optimism um, or not. I mean, especially the or not, because we do have a suicide epidemic that is just off the charts compared, to, compared with the rest of the country. And, and a lot of these people are young people, and that is my heart. My heart is, is young people. I'm teaching right now at University of California, Riverside, and you know, I'm just, I realize that like, I'm just basically obsessed with young people. I just love young people. And I'm not a mother myself, so I think all of that maternal love and compassion and interest naturally goes and it has always gone into these young people. So I'm able to sit with a student on Pine Ridge or you know, the Coeur d'Alene Reservation or just anywhere in the, the country and listen to their issues. And so when I would, they would call me to these different reservations or, or um, even urban native communities, I would come in, I'm like, okay, I've got my little stick, I've got my spiel that talks about goal setting and, and all that kind of stuff and the importance of higher education or, or whatever. And for me, it wasn't even necessarily higher education in the traditional sense. It was like, find that thing you're passionate. Like, what if you want to study native medicine? I mean, our medicine ways. Mm -hmm then find that person on the reservation, you know, and, and, and study under that person. It's not saying you have to go to school, school, but just always be learning and, you know, kind of decrease the scope and increase the focus, you know, on that, that thing that you're passionate about. That was what I was saying about education. But um, it, it naturally became something that I began to care about the issues on, on our reservations, specifically with our young people. And then that has kind of just broadened out into, um, I just, it was in D.C. this time last week um, for the United State of Women, the White House Summit, and performing there was Sliver of a Full Moon, which um, it's addresses the Violence Against Women Act with the Native Provision. And I was playing councilwoman, the first um, female tribal council chairwoman of the Eastern Band Cherokee. So it was named Terry Henry, who's just an unbelievable spitfire of a woman. And, and it just, it was kind of like the holy grail to me as an actor to get to play Wilma Mankiller and Terry Henry, you know, just like, oh, yes, and just like, you know, in those moments when Kimberly is doubting herself, it's just like, what would Wilma do? 
You know, what would Terry do? <laughs> and it just calms you down and gives you that. Again, that just kind of common sense, practical, what's good for everybody, how do we move forward, you know, kind of thing. So those, those issues, um, I think, drive me and in, in the, the decisions I make in Hollywood. So in, in addition to your, your performing and to your teaching, mm -hmm. you write. Why yes. do you write? Um, I think the writing is kind of at the heart of any storytelling because you're imagining and you're creating these worlds and you're intuiting what does the world need to hear now? You know, what does society need to hear now that they're not hearing? What do I want to hear now? And I think that's been the, the greatest, um, it's, it's been very exciting as an MFA student and it's also been kind of calming because you do feel a lot of pressure, you know, like, you know, there's, the, the whole world is bubbling right now. How do you bring some, how do you d bring a diffusing agent to that through story? I mean, we're talking millennia. That's the way indigenous people here on this continent, they dealt with stuff through story, you know? Or you even look at um, the New Testament. I think Jesus taught, I think 80% of what he said was story, was allegory, metaphor. There's something about the way that the human brain works that we naturally put things in a narrative thread. And, um, and, and, and for, for sure gives us context, which is I think what we're losing a lot of today is the context. We're getting so like little issue oriented. It's like, whoa, whoa, let's step back and look at the big picture. You know, where have we been? Where are we now? And where would we like to go with the realities that we're, we're faced with? And so I got really excited, you know, when I started, I got in this MFA program at University of California, Riverside, and it's phenomenal. And so my very first, I came in as a screenwriter um, because I have, you know, I have screen, um, I've, Screenwriting experience, but also just being an actor, I understand that format. But I came in wanting to learn how to write fiction because it's really hard to get a project greenlit in Hollywood or New York, wherever. Um, but to be able to write fiction, even if a publisher doesn't want my book, I can still publish it. I can still self-publish. You know, even if 500 people read my book, then that's, that's 500 people. That's fantastic. Um, but what was really amazing was I started, I was like, okay, you know, what of all the stories I have to tell, I've got so many inside, and it, so it was just like, well, just tell the story you'd want to hear most right now. Me, Kimberly. What do I, because I love me some television. I still love it. I love film. I love television. I love books. I love music. I love theater. And I love story. And so I wrote this um, time travel piece. Um, it was my very first film that I ever wrote, but I broke it up into 10 episodes, or actually 13 episodes of a, of a season of a pilot. And it... I, <laughs> I wrote it and my cohort really responded to it. And I'm working under Stu Krieger, who um, is an award-winning television writer, worked with Disney, ABC Disney for many years. But I, I threw it into the mix for the Humanitas Screenwriting Prize and I was, I was one of the three finalists. So this is screenwriting graduate students from all over the country. Um, it's, you know, it's SC, it's UCLA, it's mm -hmm. everywhere. And so my script this is my first television script. You know, it, it landed as one of the top three finalists, you know, for the Humanitas Screenwriting Prize. So I went to the, the big, they had this big gala award um, in LA in February. And, um, you know, I'm there with like award winning, Academy Award winning screenwriters. And I'm like, okay, like this is, you know, this is good. This is where I'm, I'm supposed to be. And so I, you know, it's exciting because I do think, um, I think I've got, it's not me. It's just, again, that antenna's been up. All this time that antenna's been up, you know, and I consider myself an amateur semiotician, which is I'm just reading the signs, reading the signs. What are the signs? What's going on? And then how do I, how do I weave that into a really entertaining, highly entertaining story that has a message at the heart that somebody could finish watching one of my shows or finish reading one of my books and, and have some tools to be able to deal with, you know, the circumstance at hand. You know, whether it's on the national level, on the familial level, on their just their community level, and so I'm really excited about that that now because I think it's now it's all about um, you know coming into this. You know, I mean, I'm pushing 50, and you know, it's just like pushing into that. Now I'm starting to push into that elder status, you know, within our community, and feeling really good about that and excited about that, and and just wanting to contribute, you know, any way I can. And so writing is is fundamental. If you don't have a good script. You don't have anything. And Chief Seattle would be proud? I think he would be proud. <laughs> I think he would be proud. I'm certainly doing my best. Kimberly Norris Guerrero, thank you so much. Thank you.